right. uh, welcome. Um, my name is Chris Catrone, and I'll be chairing and moderating this panel on Lukács' Marxism and uh, the Platypus Affiliated Society uh, organized this panel. Um, and you can find information on our organization at platypus1917.org. Um, the Platypus Affiliated Society was founded in December 2006. We organize public fora on the relevance of the history of the left and Marxism for emancipatory politics today at different campuses in Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Princeton, Toronto, Frankfurt, and in New York, where we have chapters at uh, New York University, the New School, and at Hunter College. Uh, we publish a monthly paper, The Platypus Review, which is available online and in print in the cities and campuses where we've organized student groups. Um, Please visit our literature table, which is downstairs in the gymnasium. Um, and it's uh, marked by the banner, the left is dead, long live the left. So you can't miss it. Um, all right, let me say something about uh, the panel uh, that we have this afternoon. Um, first, the description of the panel. Um, it may seem untimely to reconsider Garrett Lukacs after the demise of the Bolshevik experiment with which he was associated. Who was Lukács? Uh, was he the critic of reification, the founder of Hegelian Marxism, critical theory or Western Marxism? Or was he the philosopher of Bolshevism, apologist for Lenin, romantic socialist, voluntarist idealist, terrorist revolutionary? Lukács is usually read as an interpreter rather than as a dedicated follower of Marxism, leaving Lukács' particular contribution obscure. Uh, Lukács, however, was most original and influential when he accepted the presuppositions of Marxism, the political practice and theory of revolution, in earnest from 1919 to 1925 in history and class consciousness and associated works. However, Lukács himself may have distanced himself from them subsequently. What can we make of Lukács' legacy today, his investigation and elaboration of the problematic of Marxism, and what are the essential issues potentially raised for our time? So let me introduce our panelists. Um, we have uh, Timothy Hughes uh, from Brown University, um, Jeremy Cohen, who's sitting here in the striped shirt, uh, from New York University, Timothy Hall in the green shirt from of the University of East London, and Marco Torres, um, who's from the University of Chicago. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to announce that um, while uh, Tim Hall is in town uh, in New York, um, he's going to be giving a, a talk at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn on justice and the good life in Lukács' history and class consciousness. And uh, like I said, that's at Pratt on Monday at 12.30 p.m. Um, at the ISC building of Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, which is at 200 Willoughby Avenue, and it's in room 101A. Um, <laughs> Mark, did you have a what, marker? Mark, yes, I always have it with me. Um, we have some. You have some flyers for that, OK. We have flyers for that. Um, OK, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. We're going to present in um, alphabetical order for one of the uh, uh, better rationale. So we'll start with the introduce. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, I want to uh, I want to begin with a quotation from Adorno um, from his uh, short book on Hegel. Even ideas that were, that were at one time firmly established have a history of their truth and not a mere afterlife. They do not remain inherently indif indifferent to what befalls them. So in the light of this sentence, the question I want to ask today is uh, simple but uh, twofold. What has, befallen the, what has befallen the thought of Gail Lukács since the publication of his most influential works, in particular um, History of Class Consciousness? And secondly, how has Lukács' thought, or how does Lukács' thought, respond uh, to what has befallen it. In other, way, in other words, in what ways does Lukács' work refuse to remain in the state of inertia to which a merely historical reading would uh, consign it? 
Um, the first thing to have befallen Lukash is um, history. There are basically three three things. I'll, I'll deal with the first two pretty 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 summarily. Um, the first thing to befallen Lukash is history. Uh, is Lukash supposedly has been rendered obsolete by historical events, in particular by the fall of the Soviet Union, which has apparently transformed his political, theoretical, and aesthetic commitments into a mere um, side note. Closely associated with that fall of the Soviet Union is the is the so-called um, failure of the industrial working class to, to discover the uh, epochal role that Lukács assigned to it as the engine of history. The, re the rejection of Lukács' thought on, thought on these grounds is surprisingly widespread, even among commentators on the left, where it takes the form of a characterization of Lukács as um, a dogmatic or orthodox Marxist, as opposed to other figures within the Marxist tradition. So history. Secondly, what befell Lukács in the 20th century was Lukács himself, and I'm referring there to the series of, of self-critical prefaces uh, written by Lukács for the, for the new editions of his works, uh, published in the 1960s. Thus, um, his early work, the theory, the theory of the Novel, is condemned in Lukács' own 1962 preface for its ethically, quote, ethically tinged pessimism vis-à-vis -vis the present and for its uh, Kierkegaardization of the Hegelian dialectic of history. Similarly, the thesis of the imputed class consciousness of the proletariat put forward in history and class consciousness is condemned in Lukács' own 1967 preface to that book as no materialist consummation, but an attempt to out-Hegel Hegel, and, quote, an edifice boldly erected above every possible reality, unquote. Thirdly, and this is really most pertinent to what I want to um, talk about here. Yeah. What has befallen Lukács' thought is a critique that, is a, that has been sustained against Lukács within Marxism by an alternative tradition of Marxist theory exemplified most directly by the figure of Louis Althusser and by the aleatory or structuralist Marxism that Althusser opposes to Lukács' Hegelianism and, and humanism, uh, a tendency that is most inevident um, for, um, according to Althusser, in the, in the theme of the proletariat a proletariat as the universal um, subject of history, as well as in what Althusser refers, refers to scathingly as um, the fashionable theory of reification. Lukács' theory of the proletariat, writes Althusser in, in uh, Four Marks, is a religious one in which this universal class figures as the means of a restitution of, quote, the loss of man in revolt against its own loss, unquote. The theme of reification is similarly criticized by Althusser for, for implying the goal of a reappropriation of the human essence by man. Both of these themes have been sustained within, within Western Marxism by a subsequent inflation of Marx's early writings with their positive value attached to the human, as well as uh, uh, of the opening chapter on commodity fetishism in uh, Capital Volume 1. So each of these assaults on Lukács' thinking in various ways subjects him to the very process that he anatomized and theorized so brilliantly in history and class consciousness, a, theory, a theorization that nevertheless he later refuted, and I, I'm referring, of course, to uh, reification. So the question I want to ask is, how can we free Lukács' thinking from the form of acknowledgement that consists in limiting his relevance historically? How, how to phrase this slightly differently, how um, does Lukács' own thinking respond to what has befallen him? So uh, what I want to argue is that Lukács' thought is enabled, in a, enabled to respond to these developments if, in the face of Lukács' own account of his work, we treat his thought as a unity, albeit a, fra a fractured one. This means regarding the contradictions, developments, and breaks within Lukács' thought as constitutive, substantial, uh, rather than as contradictions that need to be resolved one way or the other. And this, I want to argue, amounts not to protecting his legacy from its obsolescence, nor to um, pitting Lukács' historicism or humanism against the aleatory or structuralist tradition, but rather to discovering the element of the aleatory and the contingent within Lukács himself. The division within 20th century Marxism uh, between Althusser and Lukács in other words, does not do justice, I want to argue, uh, to the thought of either of these two uh, figures. One of the most intriguing and audacious statements of Lukács, uh, sorry, of Althusser's aleatory dialectic is his late posthumous text entitled The Underground Current of the Materialism of the Encounter, where Althusser detects within or beneath the philosophical tradition a current of thought that, quote, runs through the 
whole history of philosophy, unquote, and that he calls the materialism of the purely contingent encounter, a materialism that seeks to overturn the logocentric priority of meaning over reality. In the philosophy of the encounter, the prior term is, is, is rather chance, um, contingency, the void, or la deviation, which is translated into English as swerve. Central to uh, Althusser's philosophy of the encounter is the principle that the encounter may or may not take place. Thus, for Althusser, uh, thus, thus what for Althusser distinguishes Epicurus from Plato and Aristotle and makes him a representative of the materialism of the encounter, that is to say, of the aleatory, of contingency, as opposed to the materialism of necessity and te teleology, is the principle of the non-anteriority of meaning. Althusser paraphrases Epicurus as follows. I'll just, I'll just read a short quotation from that essay. In order for swerve to give rise to an encounter from which a world is born, that encounter must last. It must be not a brief encounter, but a lasting encounter, which then becomes the basis for all reality, all necessity, all meaning, and all reason. But the encounter can also not last. Then there is no world. What is more, it is clear that the encounter creates nothing of the reality of the world, which is nothing but agglomerated atoms, but that it confers their reality upon the atoms themselves, which without swerve and encounter would be nothing but abstract elements, lacking all consistency and existence. So much so that we can say the atom's very existence is due to nothing but that the swerve and the encounter, prior to which they led only a phantom existence. That's the end of the, um, the uh, quotation from uh, Althusser. So very briefly, um, <clears throat> what, I want, what I will argue just in the last couple of minutes, really, is, um, is that the presence of the aleatory in Lukács' thinking is apparent in his three most central ideas. His conception of the proletarian revolution, the philosophy of form outlined in his earliest writings, and the theory of totality. The language of necessity with which Lukács describes the proletarian revolution in history and class consciousness, and in his uh, contemporaneous book on Lenin, um, encourages the sense that Lukács and Althusser are radically opposed, at least on the question of the philosophy of history. But when we attend more closely to Lukács' text, it is apparent that the use of terms such as necessity is highly qualified, that in fact, Lukács' understanding of the role of the proletariat in history is far closer to Althusser's own figure of the Kleinamen, the term Lucretius coined to describe the principle of swerve than is generally supposed. Um, sh a short quote from History and Class Consciousness. The, the consciousness of the proletariat is nothing but the expression of historical necessity. The pro but then, so he starts off with this you know, phrase, but then immediately begins to qualify that statement. The proletariat has no ideals to realize. When its consciousness is put into practice, it can only breathe life into the things which the dialectics of history have forced to a crisis. It can never, in practice, ignore the course of history, forcing on it what are no more than its own desires of knowledge. For it is itself nothing but the contradictions of history that have become conscious. That is, the proletariat is, is itself nothing but the contradictions of history that have become consciousness. So the realization, the realization of the proletariat, in other words, the coming, to, coming into formation of the proletariat, may or may not take place. It is nothing other than it's taking place. Prior to that taking place, the proletariat has, an only, uh, has, a, a, has only an atomic existence. Does the imputedness of the proletariat then function to weaken the political force of co class consciousness in Lukács' history and class consciousness, as um, Althusser apparently believed, or rather to strengthen it, to bring it into line with Althusser's own ideas about the void that underpins all history. What else is Lukács' theory of the proletariat but a theory of the void in Althusser's sense, a theory of swerve, of the Kleinema? What about the um, philosophy of form outlined in Lukács' early works, an understanding that appears to have fed directly into that later theorization of the proletariat? In the 1962 preface to the theory of the novel, Lukács confirms this suggestion Quote, it was not until 1917 that I found an answer to the problems which until then had seemed to me insoluble. When in his uh, pre-Marxist essay on Rudolf Kastner, Lukács writes, 
a real solution can only come from form, unquote. It seems impossible not to draw a connection uh, between the earlier abstract claim about form and the concrete solution of uh, historical materialism. In the theory of the novel, Lukács had written, every form is the resolution of a fundamental dissonance of existence. Every form restores the absurd to its proper place as the vehicle of the necessary condition of meaning. For the early Lukács, therefore, like the late, out, like the late Althusser, what is fundamental is not unity, but dissonance. Every form, every product of man, every intellectual concept, every effort of comprehension, every act and expression testifies to a struggle taking place in the grip of fundamental disunity. Third, this is the third, the third uh, just an illustration of this. Um, the implications of this passage should, should also be extended to uh, Lukács' political writings of the 1920s and beyond and in particular to the practical and um, philosophical investment of those works in certain key conceptual forms, most notably totality, a term that was rejected by Althusser for its um, Hegelian ambiguities. That's, uh, that's Althusser's phrase. If the capitalist system is a totality, this is not an ontological proposition, but one that implies the struggle involved in the emergence of all forms. Capitalism itself is a form, and comprehension for Lukács exists not as a penetration through form, but as the evolution of a form. The totality of the capitalist system is not something, therefore, that we need Althusser's aleatory materialism to help us escape from. It is for Lukács something to aspire to. Totality consists of nothing other than the principle of capitalism, ca capitalism's comprehensibility. But that principle is held to only in the face of and as a means of grasping the fundamental dissonance. Like the contentious category of the uh, proletariat, Lukács' category of totality is imputed, an axiom of thought rather than a product of it. The quotation from Adorno with which I began um, <coughs> continues as follows. Um, At the present time, Hegelian philosophy and all dialectical thought is subject to the paradox that it has been rendered obsolete by science and scholarship while being at the same time more timely than ever in its opposition to them. Adorno was not willing to uh, extend this generosity to Lukács, but one of the great innovations of uh, Althusser's thinking, like Adorno's, was that he was able to imbue even central texts of the philosophical tradition by Machiavelli, Spinoza, Hobbes, Rousseau, Heidegger, and of course Marx and Lenin, with a historicity of what befalls them. And it's time, it's time to extend this possibility to Lukács also. Thanks a lot. Lukash has gained some academic resp respectability of late. A sect of the academic left thinks we ought to take up many of the analytical tools Lukash has given us. Lukash helps us become more reflexive critics of capitalism, paying attention to the standpoint of our critique. He allows us to get past objective and subjective dichotomies that plague debate in the social sciences, structure versus culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He helps us talk about ideology as socially necessary illusion rather than mere will of the wits. Lukács, in summary, helps us become keener, more critical academics. I want to resist this assimilation of Lukács into the barbarism of academic reason. For the Lukács who wrote history and class consciousness would find intolerable the notion that the politics of his work could be reduced to a set of analytical tools. The book, after all, is centrally devoted to overcoming the extraction of epistemology from practical reason and method from its object. Trying to rescue the, quote, academic Lukács then becomes an exercise in contradiction. After all, it is precisely when he stopped being an academic that he felt he could move forward with his philosophical problems because they were being addressed politically by the revolutionary Marxism of his day. So who is this political Lukács? What kinds of problems was he trying to grapple with? What did Marx's politics have to do with addressing these concerns? And have his political concerns and vision been overcome, or do they still resonate with us today? To address these questions, I will offer a schematic political reading of the central essay of Lukács' history and class consciousness, reification and the consciousness of the proletariat, with two emphases. The first is that Lukács is best viewed as a philosopher of freedom, 
who wished to fulfill the emancipation bourgeois society was unable to accomplish. Second is that Lukács thought that revolutionary Marxism, in its attempt to realize the, quote, self-emancipation of the proletariat, was the only means by which this emancipatory aim might be achieved. Lukács refers to this politics by various names. The proletariat is the identical subject object of history. The standpoint of the proletariat are two of the most well-known. Despite the general consensus that this crypto-messianic or proto-Stalinist, whichever you prefer, third section of the essay, and thus the politics, would be better off soon forgotten, I will try to develop what Lukács thought the, quote, proletariat as identical subject object was, and why he thought it presented the only way forward for emancipation. The problem of Lukács' reification essay is reason at odds with itself, reason that ends in mythology, suffering, and unfreedom. Kant offered the battle cry of the Enlightenment. Ours is the genuine age of criticism to which everything must submit. Everything, not just ideas, but social institutions and forms of life too, must justify themselves by appealing to reason rather than through claims of tradition or dogma. The Enlightenment then, and the revolutions that held its ideals on their banners, the American, the French, the Haitian, the Europe-wide revolutions of 1848, looked forward to the realization of reason, freedom, and human self-development in the world, in our social institutions, and in ourselves. This would be emancipation, humanity's maturity, as Kant puts it. But bourgeois society has been unable to fulfill its promise. Instead, reason seems to have led directly to unfreedom and the neglect, if not the act of destruction, of human life. Lukács peoples his essay with characters from the great social scientists of his day, Max Weber and Georg Zimmel, the bureaucrat, the abstract, calculative individual, to describe a society where reason turns into a soulless, restrictive rationalization that shapes humanity in its narrow image. He might, like Weber, have also turned to Nietzsche's last man, the shrunken, all too reasonable, modern toady. Happy, yes, but unable to give birth to a star. Lukács demonstrates how this reason at odds with itself, this reason that turns into a more powerful and mythical dominating force than nature ever was, is in play in all forms of our society, from the factory machine to the bureaucratic state, from jurisprudence to journalism. What was supposed to free us and grant us self-control is instead mysterious and all-powerful and demands of us to sacrifice our individuality and potentiality to it. We are reduced to contemplative status, watching a world that seems entirely ready-made and eternal, rather than the kingdom of ends that the Enlightenment had promised. Lukács thinks that the first important thing that Marxism reveals about this enslaving rationality that Weber, Zimmel, etc. don't get is that it is a historical phenomenon native to bourgeois society. Secondly, Marxism can reveal this society in its full bizarreness because Marxism sees this state of affairs, this second nature of reason, as thoroughly man-made. Society, according to Lukács' reading of Marx, is for the first time truly, quote, social. A single system of social interaction underlies the production and reproduction of life of the entire globe. And this system is tied together by a new, but human, all too human phenomenon. Quote, labor, abstract, equal, comparable labor, measurable with increasing precision according to the time socially necessary for its accomplishment. This labor both produces a world of commodities and is the only measure by which the laborer can gain access to the products necessary for survival. Yet the society organized around this social activity presents itself as a second nature, the most lawlike and natural of all societies. The commodity structure, I, I'm reminded of the Marx quote, you know, bourgeois um, history, the bourgeois history, discovered history, but knew that it ended with bourgeois society. Uh, the commodity structure then is the typical structure of irrational rationality as a whole. The historical appears as timeless, the revolutionary appears as strictly law-bound, the reasonable appears as domination, and the human appears natural, where freedom might be the dull compulsion of economic relations, as Marx puts it, rears its head. Nor does academia help us in this crisis of modern reason. Disciplinary fragmentation is the rule, wherein the more we seem to know, the more reasonable each science becomes, the less it has to say about the nature of our society as a whole. Weber, in his Science as a Vocation, the anti-revolutionary lecture he was giving while Lukács was planning to storm the barricades in Hungary in 1918, says, natural science gives us an answer to the question of what we might wish to do to master life technically. It leaves quite aside whether we should and do wish to master life technically and whether it ultimately makes sense to do so. We once thought we could go to reason with our deep questions. We now know better, says Weber. <clears throat> 
This betrayal of emancipation by reason, this formalization, fragmentation, and tyrannous indifference to the particular is what Lukács calls reification. None of this, let me emphasize, can be solved by interdisciplinary programs. This is a problem, Lukács asserts, that arises, in our, that arises in our textbooks because it is real. It has a basis in our form of life. There is no way that reification can be overcome in thought because all experience in capitalist society is reified. Capitalist totality really does proceed fragmentarily, unconsciously, relegating humans into mere things. One might then take the entirety of the second part of the reification as exactly just trying to demonstrate, again and again, the inability of this problem to be overcome in thought alone. But Lukács is a philosopher of freedom, and this is a philosopher of freedom, sorry, the emphasis on freedom. And this separates his work from, what many other, from many other varieties of anti-modern discontent, of which postmodernism is just the most recent variety. He refuses to accept the necessity of this condition, to sadly shrug his shoulders at the coming barbarism. Lukács calls us to risk achieving the Enlightenment's promise, the promise of bourgeois society. Classical German philosophy, Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Schiller, and Hegel, continue to be interesting for him because they would not give up the attempt to combine reason, freedom, and human development, even as they conscientiously recognize that these could not actually be reconciled in a bourgeois world. The problem of the interrelation of subject and object in classical German philosophy is thus the technical way that philosophy had of addressing whether reason, freedom, and human development would coincide. On the one side, there is an incomplete formal reason. On the other side, an inert and irrational object. On the one side, a free subject. On the other, the brute facts and laws of the empirical world. The, quote, identical subject object, to telescope immensely a complex argument, is basically an insistence that reason and freedom can only coexist when a form of self-consciousness is seen as the solution to the tyrannous aridity of reason on the one hand and the irrational brutality of facts. I come, I, sorry, knowing myself, I and myself, are mutually constitutive. I come to know myself, and I am, but I'm not the same self as I was. I, as Nietzsche puts it, become myself. If I don't know myself, I can't transform myself. I would remain ineffectual or actively harmful without knowing myself as an object. But if I don't know myself, I remain only an object, blind, unreasonable, and unfree. Lukács insists that revolutionary Marxism is able to concretely pose the problem of emancipation because its politics seek to practically achieve the self-consciousness of capitalist society in its crisis. And capitalist society's crisis in its most acute form is the historical development and consciousness of the proletariat. As um, Tim uh, gave the Lukács quote, the proletariat is the contradiction of history become conscious. The rise of the proletariat meant, historically, the decline of the bourgeois demand for emancipation. Lukács makes this clear in his class consciousness essay. Quote, the tragedy of the bourgeoisie is reflected historically in the fact that even before it had defeated its predecessor, feudalism, its new enemy, the proletariat, had appeared on the scene. Politically, it became evident when, at the moment of victory, the freedom in whose name the bourgeoisie had joined battle with feudalism was transformed into a new repressiveness. Ideologically, we see the same contradiction in the fact that the bourgeoisie endowed the individual with an unprecedented importance. But at the same time, that same individuality was annihilated by the economic conditions to which it was subjected, by the reification created by commodity production." End quote. The proletariat's incipient demand that they themselves become the subjects promised by bourgeois society, free, creative, equal, etc., led the bourgeoisie to become vulgar to give up on the radical implications of the Enlightenment and to call for law and order. Marxism called for the ever-radicalizing demands of the proletariat to become bourgeois subjects because this would lead the proletariat to continually come up against the profound limits to their subjectivity that capitalism as such imposed, all in order that the proletariat might push forward the demand for total emancipation. The proletariat is a commodity and thus the ultimate object. She sells herself on the market, is enslaved by the machine, is thrown around by economic crises over which she has not a wit of control. The bourgeois society also promises something else, the capacity for each human being to become a subject, to be self-determinative. For Lukács, quote, the worker can only become conscious of his existence in society when he becomes aware of himself as a commodity. 
or, quote, his, the proletariat's consciousness, is the self-consciousness of the commodity. The commodity, this irrational reason, can itself make demands for its emancipation, because the typical commodity is the proletariat. The inverse of this is also true. The proletariat might be seen as, in some ways, the quintessential abstract bourgeois subject who struggles to appropriate society's resources for their purpose represent a demand that the object, the product of the so history of social labor, be infused with their subjective purposes. We are used to thinking of the natural constituency of the left as those who are marginal to society, who face society as an enormous, hostile power bearing down on them over which they have little influence and control. Lukács developed the daring claim that, of revolutionary Marxism that capitalism must overcome itself, not through the intervention of some outside, but by the action of those at its very center. The proletariat is, quote, the typical fate of the whole society, says Lukács, a reified creature through and through. Marxism is not the resistance to capitalism or to reification or to bourgeois subjectivity. It is their realization and thus would have to be their self-overcoming. Capital can, over be, can only be overcome by means of capital. In order for the members of the proletariat to really become bourgeois subjects, proper members of the kingdom of ends, as it were, they would have to, be com they would have to stop being objects entirely. In other words, bourgeois society would have to end. But the proletariat's social position does not at all guarantee that it will push the demands of emancipation to their utmost, only that they might. Politics is the attempt to realize this potential. Lukács thought that the essence of Marx's politics was that socialism, in order to achieve the emancipation promised by the Enlightenment, would have to be a conscious human act. It could not be deduced from social being. If one could stumble into socialism, if it was fated from time immemorial by inexorable laws, then it would be one more form of unfreedom, a fake subjectivity. Human consciousness would be an integral part of objective development, or it would be nothing at all. Lukács saw in political figures like Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin the political thinking that could realize bourgeois society's potential self-overcoming because of their focus on the non-automatic character of the transition to socialism. They criticize both inevitabilism and the reduction of the proletariat to just another sectional interest, seeking its cut of the pie. This, they said, was not Marxism, the politics of freedom, at all. Passages like the following from Rosa Luxemburg's Reformer Revolution were key for him. I quote Luxemburg, so that if we do not consider momentarily the immediate amelioration of the worker's condition, an objective common to our party program as well as to revisionism, the difference between the two outlooks is, according to the present conception of the party, i.e. the revolutionary conception of the party, trade union and parliamentary activity, are important for the socialist movement because such activity prepares the proletariat, that is to say, creates the subjective factor of the socialist transformation for the task of realizing socialism. We say that as a result of its trade union and parliamentary struggles, the proletariat becomes convinced of the impossibility of accomplishing a fundamental social change through such activity and arrives at the understanding that the conquest of power is unavoidable." End quote, Luxembourg. Luxembourg sought then to struggle with the proletariat and its halting attempts to achieve bourgeois subjectivity in order to constantly push against the limits of how much subjectivity capitalism could grant the workers. Also that the proletariat might someday demand the end of there being a mere object to call. Furthermore, political education and action around these limits would be designed to call workers to learning about how they came to be what they are, i.e. to understand historically there being an expression of the crisis of capital, and thus be faced with the gravity of the task ahead for achieving freedom. Revolutionary Marxism, then, was for Lukács the attempt to realize the promises and possibilities of bourgeois society by consistently pressing forward the demand for subjectivity contained in the commodity itself, the proletariat. This politics, an extremely telescope for, insists on, among other things, one, the leading role of the proletariat as the most typical element and the crisis point of capitalism, an emphasis on the subjective development of the proletariat and any struggles it undergoes, the importance of emphasizing not victories, but the limits of any given interest pursued action by the proletariat, the concomitant value of self-criticism and self-transformation, the centrality of self-transformative political practice, an organization or party dedicated, as Lukács quotes Marx in the Communist Manifesto, to bringing out the international and historical significance of a given action, to connecting any given action with the philosophy of freedom. The party tries to make, through propaganda and education, but also through political practice, the proletariat aware, aware of, and thus capable of, affecting themselves as the world historical crisis of capitalism. 
because this also means the potential for the proletariat to cash in modernity's blank check of ever-expanding horizons of development and freedom. This politics seeks to work through what seems like an insoluble problem, a politics of emancipation arising from a proletariat which, as the most typical product of bourgeois society, has a consciousness that is reified through and through. Lukács says about Marxism that it does not follow that this knowledge or this methodological attitude, Marxism, is the inherent or natural possession of the proletariat as a class. But the struggle of the proletariat to achieve its own possibility was for Lukács just another side, the dialectical inverse, of the struggle of bourgeois society to achieve its own potential, a historical open question that would not be decided by any law, but only by self-conscious self-action. The crisis of Marxism becomes the most acute form of the crisis of capitalism. All this, finally, for Lukács, is in order that the proletariat achieve not, quote, the immediate realization of the socially given existence of the class, but as the young Marx clearly saw and defined, its self-annihilation. Only by constant, unremitting effort, confrontation of limits, and self-criticism might the proletariat be able to achieve full bourgeois subjectivity, and thus abolish it and its achievement. I'm coming to the end here to, to summarize, um, to, to bring together. The proletariat is then not on the margins of capitalist development, it is at its core. It is not an irrational substratum that resists incorporation into capitalist rationality, it is entirely rationalized. But the upshot is that if the typical object of capitalist society, the proletariat, acts and thereby sharpens the contradictions of capitalist society, revealing in ever clearer form the impossibility of keeping the promises of bourgeois society in bourgeois form, if this all does not happen, there will be plenty of resistance and flux. But unless capital, the dynamo of modernity, is overcome from within, rather than from deus ex machina from without, you won't get the self-overcoming of capitalist society at its highest point and the realization of the freedom that all of modernity might mean. Instead, resistance becomes the cry that accomplishes a resigned acceptance to the unfreedom of the social and political world as a whole. I'm reminded of Walter Benjamin's call for us to redeem the dead generations. Unless capitalism is capable of becoming really reasonable, and thus overcoming capitalism, then the history of the last few centuries, maybe even all of world history, is nothing but villainies, deceptions, betrayals, thefts, robberies, arsons, and murder. The wage on emancipation that Lukács asks us to make is a wager on capitalist society's ability to overcome itself. Key to this, then, is what is most native to capitalism, the proletariat, that might transform it from within. In some ways, I think the key to Lukács' history and class consciousness might be summed up in Freud's famous description of psychoanalysis, wo es war, soll ich werden, where it was, I shall be. The I, who is now where it was, is not the same I as before. Self-consciousness changes us. But we are still somehow us. We have realized something about ourselves. Nor is self-consciousness merely in the brain. To be really self-conscious, we need to change our whole way of being. There, there's an old joke that, you know, Today, people come into psychoanalysis, and the first thing they say is, you know, uh, I've had these strange dreams, and, you know, they have, represent all sorts of bizarre formulations, but the one thing I know is that it's my mother that's behind it all. Um, right? And so th they know that, but the fact that they're still having these dreams means they don't know it. The, to know something is actually to be capable of changing it. Lukács' Marxism is then trying to recognize that Marxism poses the question to bourgeois society and modernity as a whole whether or not it can achieve this kind of transformative self-consciousness. The prospects do not look bright. I don't think this all, to come back to sort of where I started, I don't think this all seems so messianic because we have definitively surpassed Lukács and his silly metaphysical speculations. I think Lukács seems so distant because we find ourselves no, able, no longer able to imagine this kind of freedom. We no longer think that capitalism as a whole can be overcome for the better, that its contradictions might be developed in ever more comprehensive forms, and that it might be developed into a society where reason, freedom, and human development are intertwined. Instead, capitalism is a brute, inert, foreign entity dominating us in our capacities, and we thus look to the marginal, the suffering, the pain, and offer our sympathy and solidarity with their struggles. Struggles that, we assume, are part of the natural law of history. There will be power, there will be resistance. Our politics take something like the form of Nietzsche's eternal return. As critical as we are, we can only imagine freedom as something totally foreign to the source of our domination, swooping in and bringing its freedom from beyond into our miserable lives. But then, I certainly don't feel as confident as Lukács did. Not at all. 
Because after all, didn't his wager fail? Didn't the European and Russian revolutions of the 1917 to 1923 period fail to produce emancipation and in their stead give us Nazism and Stalinism? In a world where the global status quo seems more outside of our control evermore, where political revolutions can ultimately only redistrib redistribute the pittances of an increasingly miserable present order, how do we expect Lukács' political project to ring true to us? But here is the most important question. Was Lukács a fool for wagering on the possibility of freedom, i.e. by becoming politically a Marxist? That the irrational reason of modernity might be overcome from within by that most typical product, the proletariat, demanding its subjectivity? Lukács would rely on Luxembourg's call, socialism or barbarism, either we place on the historical agenda the imminent overcoming of capitalism and its irrational rationality, or we resign ourselves to ever new, ever horrifying forms of reasonable barbarism. I'll end with a quote from Lukács. When the moment of transition to the realm of freedom arrives, this will become apparent just because the blind forces really will hurtle blindly towards the abyss, and only the conscious will of the proletariat will be able to save mankind from the impending catastrophe. In other words, when the final economic crisis of capitalism develops, the fate of the revolution, and with it the fate of mankind, will de depend on the ideological maturity of the proletariat, i.e., on its class consciousness. Without Lukács' Pascalian wager on freedom, it is not clear to me that Lukács is worth much of anything at all. The demon that drove him from philosophy to the politics of revolutionary Marxism is, if anything, what should call out to us today not the analytical tools we can dig up from the grave of his philosophy of freedom. Or maybe he is just a dead dog. It's, it's getting uh, quite full in here, isn't it? <laughs> The mind the iron cage, the black box. Um, well, my uh, talk really uh, closely relates to um, what, what uh, uh, Tim has said and, and Jeremy as well. Um, that's to say that um, uh, I, I certainly would read Lukash as a thinker of the elitary. Uh, and at the same time, like Jeremy, I would, would read Lukács as a philosopher of freedom. Uh, and to hold those two thoughts together, I think, is a, uh, a very interesting thing. And Mark and, and uh, Mark's Lukács out um, today. And, and obviously, you know, inevitably, Lukács and the president. And where do we stand with Lukács today? And um, Tim's uh, question about what would Lukács think of his own obsolescence again uh, there's no way around that question I think if one comes to um, Lukács today, today particularly history and class consciousness which like uh, Jeremy I'm going to speak about and I, you know, it's a, it's a great text, uh, History and Class Consciousness. I think it really does pay the kind of attention that, uh, that uh, Jeremy has uh, given to it there. If Lukács' name is invoked today, well, I think to, the chances are that two related claims will come to mind. Um, the first, that in modern capitalist societies, uh, social relations are reified. And the second, that the proletariat are the identical subject object of history. Um, and it's these two claims I want to uh, focus on. The first claim, in my understanding at least, relates to Lukács' celebrated generalization of Marx's analysis of the commodity pool. I'm thinking here about the Central essay, the central essay in history and class consciousness, uh, uh, replication and uh, consciousness of the proletariat. And the way that Lukács begins with uh, Marx's analysis of commodity and capital, uh, capital one, and what he does with it, uh, which, which I still think 
repays careful attention. Um, so you know, what, what, what he seems to be doing there is to suggest that, you know, like Marx or following Marx, that, um, that um, labor, um, abstract labor, comes to be um, uh, incorporated into, um, into uh, reified social objects. Um, paradigmatically, the uh, um, uh, reification or the uh, alienation of subjectivity into uh, commodities moving on the market. Um, and then he goes on from there to look at, to analyze the same process in um, bureaucracy, in legal systems, in journalism, uh, celebrated examples of um, the, the, the journalist as the, the uh, apogee of reification insofar as their, their very talents are uh, commodified. Um, but also in culture as well, as, uh, um, as Jeremy mentioned in relation to the division of labor in the sciences. Um, and I, I, I'm going to come back and say more about this, but I think this is a terribly significant move in, in Marxism, this generalization of commodity form. The second claim, then, the, uh, the notion that the proletariat is a subject of overcoming, uh, i.e. that societal reification can be overcome, uh, contra labor, um, through the recovery of uh, alienated social activity lying dormant in things. Uh, now, both claims have been roundly criticized. The second, I would suggest, more so than the first, but the generalization of the commodity form uh, has also been criticized too. Um, some you know, standard critiques, particularly the way that Lukács' work has developed in the Frankfurt School, that um, to call something commodified today is, is really meaningless. Um, so you've got a generalization to the point of vacuity. It doesn't really say anything anymore to say, to, to describe social relations as reified. And a, a light of this as well, a paralysis of social action. Get, you know, Adorno, uh, you know, late Adorno, um, you know, commodification, uh, or a kind of total reification thesis where, whereby any action, any political action is impossible. Um, and subject object uh, identity, well, vitiated by history itself. Um, and also appreciated on the grounds that um, history has no subject at all. It's wrong-headed to think about history in this way. Someone that uh, has argued this strikingly and very well is uh, Moshe Bostow. Um, Bostow, as I'm sure you're aware, sees considerable potential in the crushing move of generalizing the commodity group. But um, Postone argues that uh, Lukács is um, it's unable to capitalize on this because of classical assumptions that remain in place in the social theory. Um, principle uh, amongst this is the, the notion of labor uh, as an invariant, as a historical invariant. If we recall uh, Postone's critique of Lukács, everything turns on the Hegelian legacy in, uh, in Marxism. Uh, whether 
the self-moving substance that is subject um, is not the laboring subject, as a stone argues that Lukács thinks, um, or, the, or the proletariat, but, but capital itself. So it's not Postone's critique is that the Lukács is wrong to suppose that there is a subject of history. And um, to the extent that there is, it's capital itself. This is a kind of funny type of subject, because uh, it's not a subject capable of consciousness at all, but if we are looking for something uh, to make sense of a kind of Hegelian legacy in Marxism, then we should think about um, self-moving substance as subject as capital itself. Far-reaching consequences follow from this um, in uh, Ostone's reading, very, very striking reading. There's no historical meta-subject meta for one. Uh, so the idea of historical meta-subjects is just an error that um, Lukács, more than anybody else, uh, bequeaths to, to, to Marxist thought. Um, totality, as well, the concept of totality loses its normativity in Ostone's uh, critique. Uh, if, if there is opposition to something like generalized commodity relations, that is an opposition to totality itself. And uh, interestingly as well, the idea that uh, idealism is not really the issue between materialism and, 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 and idealism, again, the classical idealism. Um, for what the Postone reading of, uh, of Marx uh, invites us to think, is that Hegel himself grasped in an approximate way the peculiar ontology of capitalism. That's to say capitalism as a, as a real abstraction. Now these are, um, you know, this is a profoundly interesting critique, uh, I think, and uh, you know, one which is suggestive in all sorts of ways. But uh, I'm, I'm not personally persuaded by it. Um, is is Postone right about Lukács? Let's go back to this initial move in the reification essay. Um, that's to say, Lukács' generalization of the commodity form. By showing that social activity, or by showing how social activity in general comes to be integrated into abstract social systems, Lukács on my reading at least, it seems to be departing once and for all from the reductionism that Postoni is criticizing him for. You'll notice a kind of slippage in my language here. It goes from talking about labor uh, integrated into abstract social <coughs> systems to social activity uh, generally. Um, but this is actually what I think move that uh, Lukács is making. Um, that's to say, uh, Lukács, again, in this the question of the relation to Hegel, is raising the question that, that uh, Gillian Rose, I think, uh, posed well in uh, Hegel Conscious Sociology in the early 80s. Uh, what's the difference? What's the essential difference between the productivity of spirit and the productivity of labor? And in terms of thinking about the, uh, the Hegelian legacy in, in, in uh, Marx's thought, for me, that's a much more productive way of 
thinking about this, not least for the fact that it's uh, based on phenomenology, or it's more focused on the phenomenology than the logic. A very strange text, I think, and uh, you know, struggled to see how that could be seen as a kind of proleptic analysis of capital. Uh, but for other reasons too, um, there's no concept of class. I mean, if people goes down the stones, what happens to class? Should one so readily dispense with notions of, of, of class and class domination? Uh, of course, there are problems with class politics in this classical formulation, but nonetheless. Um, that, that, that shouldn't lead to a kind of wholesale deletion of it. Uh, and I'm closer to Adorno's view there that the problem of modernity is class domination without opportunities for class consciousness. Um, so, coming back to Lukács' relevance then. Um, yes, I think Lukács is relevant insofar as he offers a basis for thinking about class politics, albeit one no longer tied to the point of production. Uh, that follows, I think, from, uh, from uh, thinking about the generalization of the commodity form as involving uh, not the integration of labor into abstract social systems, but social activity generally. In one sense, I mean, Lukács is not really a Marxist. One thinks about the primacy of the economic. That's a kind of paradigmatic primacy. Um, but there's nothing particular about labor as it comes to be incorporated into abstract social systems, at least not in my region. Totality, of course, returns as a, a normative concept, or if one is a, a thinking in a Lukashian way today, totality is there, whether that's the, the notion of transdisciplinarity or uh, of some way of um, linking stuff together um, uh, and, and breaking through the uh, intellectual division of labor. Uh, but above all, I think, um, through the notion of politics of an ontological experiment, um, that is to say, as involving uh, a risk, uh, a risk which, as Jeremy has pointed out, involves a risking of a staking of one's own identity, uh, and for which there is no precedent or, or, or law to guide us in this way. So I would concur with uh, what Tim was saying about uh, the strange kind of normative functioning of totality in, in Lukács' work. That doesn't mean return to Kant in some way. Uh, really does, it seems to me, really does totality function obviously as a regular idea. Um, so, uh, I think I'll stop there, um, and uh, head over the bar. All right, um, so uh, my remarks are a bit shorter uh, and than my other panelists, um, and uh, they echo uh, Jeremy's sentiments quite a bit. So <clears throat> I'm both wearing the same pin, so you can um, imagine that. Um, so there is a common reading of Georg Lukács' work that places his best-known essay, Reification and the Consciousness of the Proletariat, at the beginning of the so-called Western Marxist tradition. In a purely factual sense, this is undeniable. Not only was this essay the foundation the, the most important foundation of everything Adorno and Benjamin ever wrote. It was also a key text for later Western Marxists, such as Lucien Goldman, Frederick, Fred, Frederick Jameson, 
and an object of attack for Al Husser and his followers. Most recently, Lukács' text has been backhandedly complimented as the most brilliant of the so-called traditional Marxisms by Moshe Bastone and his Valley Critique Epigonies. <laughs> the fact that it has become natural to understand reification in the consciousness of the proletariat as the originary moment in the canon of 20th century critical theory or Western Marxism is very unfortunate. This label frequently obscures a true intellectual tradition that Lukács sought to intersect the early 20th century revolutionary Marxism of characters like Korsh, Liebknecht, Trotsky, Luxembourg, and far above all, Lenin. It is, the it is the essay's first section that most readily lends itself to, to assimilation into the so-called Western Marxist canon. Dealing with the phenomenon of reification, the section presents us with a worldview and a problematic that should be familiar to anyone with the most basic acquaintance with 20th century anti-capitalist thought. Lukács' phenomenon of reification theorizes a world where Marx's concept of alienation does not apply only to labor, but is a matter of human subjectivity and of all social relations. A world where these social uh, relations take on a thing-like character and where self-reproduction of society becomes a mechanism beyond the reach of human agency. Never for a second straying away from the original Marxian concept of the commodity form of social life, Lukács describes a world where political actors have been reduced to spectators of inscrutable social machinery whose workings can never be fully understood thanks to the specialization and bureaucratization of knowledge. The general contours of this worldview, however, could just as well be attributed to reactionaries such as Martin Heidegger or far inferior works of Marxist theory such as Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. They can likewise be found in something like Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment, which, is, which in spite of its profound debt to Lukács, is a work conceived from a radically different historical standpoint. What is so important to keep in mind when reading Lukács' reification essay is that, unlike works such as Dialectic of Enlightenment, it was written at a time before the Stalinist Thermidor was an accomplished fact, when the victory of fascism, the Hitler-Stalin Pact, the Second World War, and the death camps were either unimaginable or the wild fantasies of the worst pessimists. What we should not forget about reification and the consciousness of the proletariat is that it was written at a time when critical theory, as we, with big, big C critical theory, as we came to know it, did not yet seem like a necessity because the unprecedented barbarism of the First World War appeared as a setting for the final struggle for universal human emancipation instead of what it turned out to be the dramatic unveiling of an enlightenment turned against its own project of freedom, a new dark age well lit by electric light bulbs and nuclear blasts. It is well known that Lukács considered killing himself around 1915 because of the death of his closest friend Irma Seidler. I am certain, however, that in 1922, upon the publication of History and Class Consciousness, Lukács would have given suicide another shot if he had somehow looked into the future to find that his book would amount to little more than fodder for politically impotent Marxist professors in the Cold War and its aftermath. This is because the Lukács of 19. <laughs> this is because the Lukács of 1922 was first and foremost a communist revolutionary and only secondarily a theoretician of Marxism. He never meant for his concept of reification to be at the center of any kind of 20th century critical theory of society. For him, the concept of reification was eminently political and inseparable from the lessons of contemporary revolutionary practice. The reification essay, as well as the rest of history and class consciousness. Uh, were meant as a theoretical elaboration of the period of explosive development in Marxist politics that began with the revisionist debate of 1900 and continued through to the collapse of social democracy and the world, rev the world revolution of 1917. Lukács' writings of the early 1920s were a digestion, a reprocessing of the political innovations of rev revolutionists such as Rosa Luxemburg and Vladimir Lenin who rebelled against the organizational conservatism and opportunism of the Second International. 
So when Lukács writes about the cont contemplative and fragmentary character of the bourgeois class standpoint, he is less concerned with individual capitalists, financial speculators, or economists than he, than, than he is with the political leadership of the second international social democracy. When he describes the disjointed mere facticity with which social phenomena manifest themselves in bourgeois consciousness, his object of critique is the inability of the second international leadership to recognize and act upon the terminal crisis of capitalism that developed in the lead up to the First World War. In this sense, however, in this sense, however obvious it might be to find the Weberian critique of dehumanizing rationalization behind Lukács' concept of reification, the key to its true political meaning lies behind Lukács' con uh, lies, sorry, lies elsewhere. For example, in Rosa Luxemburg's critique of Edward Bernstein's eclectic, piecemeal, and positivistic understanding of the development of late 19th century capitalism. Or even more so in Lenin's theory of imperialism as the necessary, inevitable, terminal phase of capitalism in opposition to Karl Kautsky's notion that imperialism was no more than a wrong-headed militaristic policy of the European ruling classes. As I said before, the critique of reification, with its romantic and existential aroma, is easy to assimilate to a Lukács as critical theorist paradigm. His understanding of proletarian consciousness, however, is not. Commentators have met the classic, uh, commentators have met the classically Lukacian formulations of the proletariat as identical subject-object of history and of imputed class consciousness uh, with puzzlement, skepticism, and hostility. Thanks to this understanding of, sorry, Thanks to his understanding of, of class consciousness, to his, sorry, thanks to this understanding of class consciousness, Lukács has been accused of idealism, of ontologizing labor, and of incip incipient Stalinism. The fact is that the way Lukács unfolds his concept of class consciousness from his understanding of reified social relations is Leninist through and through. And I believe that the allergy to this concept can be attributed to the twin historical phenomena of the Stalinist and Maoist vulgarization of Lenin's thoughts on the one hand, and on the other, the kind of, the kind of dogmatic anti-Leninism of much of the Cold War era Western left. To properly reconsider a category like imputed class consciousness, we would first and foremost have to uh, we would first and foremost have to rid ourselves of the old bogey that Lenin's approach to party politics was somehow authoritarian. We would have to rid ourselves of the extremely silly idea that young Lenin that the young Lenin was already planning for gulags and show trials in 1902 when he wrote uh, that class consciousness could only be brought to the proletariat by means of a centralized Marxist, Marxist party. To read Lukacs properly, in short. It would be salutary to briefly put down our Althusser and our Poston and pick up what is to be done. In what is to be done, Lenin draws his famous, uh, his infamous distinction between true proletarian, that is, Marxist consciousness, and mere trade union consciousness. It is no exaggeration to say that this distinction is the basis for some of the most profound thinking about the role of Marxism, Marxism as a, a theory and as a form of politics in a society of reified social relations. In Reification in the Consciousness of the Proletariat, Lukács seeks to do no more, not, not, to do nothing else, no more, than elucidate the meaning of Lenin's thoughts when he writes, uh, when Lukács writes that, Reification is the necessary, immediate reality of every person living in capitalist society. It can be overcome only by constant and constantly renewed efforts to disrupt the reified structure of existence by concretely relating to the concretely manifested contradictions of the total development, by becoming conscious of the imminent meanings of these contradictions for the total development. Only when the consciousness of the proletariat is able to point out the road along which dialectics of history is objectively impelled, but which it cannot travel unaided, will the consciousness of the proletariat awaken to a consciousness of the process, and only then will the proletariat become the identical subject-object of history whose praxis will change reality. This is uh, more. This is as much Lenin as it is Lukács.
for Lenin, the role of Marxist theory and political organization was to go beyond the immediacy of bread and butter, trade union politics, to make conscious those social tendencies and those struggles which pointed to a possible overcoming of capitalism. The, par the party was meant to make connections between seemingly distant struggles, to sharpen political contradictions, to retreat or push, never spontaneously and always deliberately, in Lukács' words, through constant and constantly renewed struggle to place the proletariat's moment momentary battles in the larger context of its, of its historical mission. In its original conception, the Leninist party was a spear of consciousness, meant to pierce the obduracy of reified social relations. But what is to be done is 110 years old, and history and class consciousness will soon turn 90. Despite their age, we keep returning to these texts because in today's murky atmosphere, we simply cannot reproduce their lucidity. Nevertheless, to pick up reification, the reification essay and simply ask ourselves how they apply to our present political situation or our current economic crisis would be overly optimistic if not simply foolish. The crisis today cannot become a threat to capitalism simply because there is no proletarian movement with revolutionary Marxist leadership to actually threaten the social order. No. The only way to think about Lukács' relevance to the present is to mediate our thinking by an acute consciousness of the 90 years of defeat and regression that separate the writing of reification and the consciousness of the proletariat from our own time. In this sense, the only appropriate way to think about Lukács' theory is to not think about him as a Western Marxist critical theorist, but instead to think of him as a revolutionary in the context of the upheavals of the early 20th century. To read reification and the consciousness of the proletariat without also reading and rereading Luxembourg, Trotsky, and Lenin is little more than an empty academic exercise. What I'd like to do then is give uh, the panelists a chance to respond to one another <clears throat> briefly. Um, or pose questions to one another on the basis of their presentations. Um, and then we will turn it over after that, after a round of that, um, turn it over to the audience Q&A. Um, so I'd like to uh, go back in the same order with which we did the presentations. Uh, I think, yeah. Um, <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I just want to say that um, I... Um, I agree with uh, almost everything that my <laughs> colleagues have, have, um, have said, and I, I, I've been really, really enjoyed uh, these presentations. Um, one thing I wanted to, um, I suppose, um, there's, there's, a, there's a certain kind of um, uh, similar um, uh, theme, at least or sub theme, very much a sub theme, I think, to, in particular to Jeremy's presentation and, um, and Marco's, is the way that they framed uh, their. their um, their, um, what they were saying, and I, and I really sort of agree very much with the, the, um, the need to avoid turning, let's say, the reification essay, and this is really a kind of common theme to all of the um, uh, papers here, but the reification essay is, uh, or the, the concept of, and category of reification is really endangered when we turn it into an analytic tool for the analysis uh, of cultural phenomena that can somehow be applied uh, in an academic way to yield up uh, readings of, uh, of um, cultural objects. I mean, I completely agree with this. Uh, true I, blood as verification. Sorry? <laughs> like, 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 true blood as verification. Yeah. Like, insert cultural object. And yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think all, the, all that all this is really kind of well, well, well said. But um, I, I wanted to say one thing about the, uh, the place of blue cash in, in, the, in the academy. Because um, as somebody who um, works in the academy, I guess I... Um, nervous about um, about kind of opposing in a very um, uh, large sort of conceptual way some 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 category like the proletariat to some other category like the um, the academy. Um, uh, after all, most people in this room I would be willing to bet have some connection with the academy. Um, most, I think. I mean, I'm not saying. Uh, uh, and we're all meeting, in fact, in a, in a un on a university premises. So it's very, it's very. It makes me a little nervous to to um, 
to sort of turn. I mean, I wish there was more loot catching in the academy. This is really my 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 point, I suppose. Um, uh, and I I also think that it's it's completely right to um, to say that the answer to uh, reification of the reification technology is not interdisciplinary programs. I mean, Jeremy, you made this point. I mean, it's, it's completely right. But, but on the other hand, in uh, academic work um, is ridden and ever more ridden every every year by professionalization and by specialization and and I yearn for uh, a bit of loop action to um, uh, a bit of loop action to analysis and verification to to try and uh, sort of counteract that. Um, so um, so one of the yeah so that so there's um, uh, so I kind of also want not to uh, sort of or at least to, to use loop action some way to avoid Idealizing um, the proletariat, and uh, just to just to to, um, to register um, something that uh, that Marcus said right at the end of his um, of his um, presentation. I mean, I agree with almost everything that that, um, that Marcus has said. Uh, uh, Lukács absolutely should be should be read, read alongside Lenin and through Lenin. Um, but I'm I'm the thing that I'm the the the, uh, the moment that I caught was caused some slight hesitancy was when you said at the end. The, Marco, the, uh, the only way of really avoiding academicizing Lukács is by developing an acute consciousness of the 90 years that separate them from our time. And um, my feeling is that uh, the opposite is, is, is perhaps another way of, uh, of avoiding the ac academicization of, of Lukács. In fact, um, developing an acute consciousness of the 90 years that separates us from Lukács is, I think, one way of, of academicizing him in, uh, in, uh, in a kind of Probably a different way than you're suggesting, okay. but um, but I I, I think that um, that um, the proletariat itself need, needs to be um, our, our understanding of the of the proletariat. Lukash's um, understanding of the imputed consciousness of the proletariat is in fact an occasion for us to to um, liberate um, the concept of the proletariat from its, um, its uh, from a kind of historical. Um, uh, uh, rigidification of the notion of the proletariat that, that, it's, that it's very difficult to, to um, maintain in the same way that it comes to it. I guess I'll just be brief. I also enjoyed very much uh, everyone's presentation. I, mean, I really um, agreed with, with um, both, both teams um, <laughs> with their uh, respective um, attempts to show the ways in which Althusser and Postone, I think, really fundamentally um, misread Lukács. And, uh, you know, I mean, Althusser thinking that Lukács is the thinker of teleology when the whole point of history is class consciousness is to, as Marco was talking about, oppose the teleological view of the second international Marxists is, is just, like, mind-boggling. Like, how, how, I don't understand how you can have that reading. And then for Postone, I mean, literally the first time I read Reification of Class Consciousness. I had read Post Stone, but I had not read his essay on Lukash. And the line that follows very shortly after the line I quoted about abstract equal comparable labor, blah, blah, blah. Um, Lukash says, the labor of the capitalist division of labor existing both as a presupposition and the product of capitalist production is born only in the course of the development of the capitalist system. And I literally wrote in my margin, Post Stone, no, oh, labor is you know, capitalist, it's only capitalist. And so the idea that Postone could then sort of somehow bizarrely like miss out on this, I mean, I, I think that Tim over here, um, your your claim that one should use Lukash in some ways to try to peer into why systematically bad readings from intelligent people keep getting produced by this book, um, and I think that part of it um, has to do with the the way in which I mean what well, Margaret was talking about the way in which Lukash is assimilated to into a line of Western Marxism is kind of like you know it's kind of like Lukash's the, the kind of thing that Lukash imagined history and class consciousness as being able to do, which was influence the development of proletarian or socialist politics generally and push it forward. Instead, that failed, and it very obviously failed, and Lukash himself sort of gave up on that project. And by reading Lukács as sort of like, well, there was Lukács, and then there was 
Borkheimer and Adorno, and then there was, you know, um, uh, Merleau Ponty, and then there was, et cetera, <laughs> like, is, is a way of assuming from the get-go that Lukács' project was doomed to failure, and that he was bound to end up as the, um, as the, the father of the, the school of critical theory. Whereas in some ways, critical theory in its best moments sh recognizes that, you know, that Adorno line that philosophy has missed the moment of its realization, that every, can, every time critical theory needs to go back and talk about why critical theory is necessary, it, it is a failure. Because the, the point of critical theory, which is to make critical theory no longer necessary, because actually, because you'd be doing emancipation, hasn't been achieved. Yeah. Um, like um, uh, Tim and uh, Jeremy, I find myself in a lot of agreement. Um, I, I too, as I, as I said in, uh, in my talk, think of Lukács as a, uh, a philosopher of freedom. He really. said, so, and I do this in a way, he tracks onto that idea of tradition. Um, either um, history acts with us or we act through history. Uh, that seems to be the formulation of uh, the Kantian uh, thought of autonomy uh, in, the, in the groundwork for the, the offices there. Um, and I, I also agree that it's, it's hard, it's easier to, to, to say that one's transcended Lukács' categories do we stuck with Lukács in a certain way. I think. I mean, we're still talking about little subjects. Uh, and when we talk about little subjects, we are um, inevitably um, invoking Lukashian language. And Neil Larson, who wrote this fantastic uh, essay on Postone just this way, and just kind of how we kind of re reinscribe the kind of Lukashian um, I, I'm also, you know, like, like Tim as well, I'm a, um, a little unsure about um, Lukács and, and Lenin, in a sense. I mean, I, you know, you, it, it certainly is an attempt to influence um, the moment back then. But I mean, we shouldn't get away from the fact that you know, these large this large um, um, diversion, really, a metacritic of idealism. I mean, I'm sitting there at the point of world revolution, and Lukács is exalting this degree to Luther, and Victor, and Hegel, and, uh, and the critique of judgment from Schelling. You think about these moments as formative for both political subjects and the Christ. Uh, but, but the meta critique of my view, the central rather than section of the word vacation essay, um, you know, what it seems to be doing here is, is taking the idea of concepts of form. And um, uh, of subjecting them to an imminent critique to the point where one gets uh, a conceptual practice, uh, which is a material reason, I think, a material concept of reason. So, uh, there's also a contemplative moment there as well in Lukács and the importance of thought. Well. I, I, I'm uncertain that that's wholly exhausting uh, in the claim of authentic religious politics, as, um, for example, Gijek uh, said, as faith to uh, the uh, intense of history. But I'll stop there. It's very interesting to hear what others have to say. Welcome. Um, well, I'll, I'll also say that the Grace presentation was very, very interesting. Um, and um, that said, um, uh, I wanted to answer uh, Tim B's, uh, 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 what, what he said about uh, the, the 90, uh, the, what I said about how we need to take into account the 90 years of regression, uh, um, that was a bit of uh, uh, um, uh, a remark towards uh, the panelists who was not uh, here. Um, 
Neil Larson, um, because his, and, and you know, I don't want to like criticize him when he's not here or something, but in, 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 in the essay by him that I read, um, um, he talks about, uh, you know, uh, Lukács's uh, understanding of, of crisis um, and, uh, and uh, being able to sort of take hold of, 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 a, of, a, of a social crisis uh, and how that applies to the crisis uh, that we have today. And, uh, you know, what I'd like to, to just say is that, that I don't think that capitalism is in crisis. I think that capitalism is readjusting. I think it is, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, fortunes were destroyed and there was a financial tumult. Uh, but uh, I don't think that means that capitalism is anywhere near its end. There's, uh, in fact, no um, uh, no uh, social agency, no constituency, nothing, uh, uh, no leadership to be able to overcome capitalism. Uh, actually, if we, uh, you know, uh, the end of capitalism today, would, you know, without that, without socialist leadership, would look something out of a Cormac McCarthy novel or something. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, what I, what I mean by the, the 90, 90 years of regression is, is, is to take into account uh, uh, history as, as mediation, uh, this history of defeat as, as, a, as, a, as a sort of our way to, you know, the, the reason that we can't either apply Lukács in the present, but that we're actually not also not smarter than him at the same time. That we're sort of stuck with this, you know. It's like uh, uh, something that I've used before, uh, uh, a kind of um, uh, a metaphor that I've used before. It's like we have, you know, it's like we have a roadmap uh, for like revolutionary politics, but it's like a hundred years old, and they've like changed all the streets. You know, they've like moved all the streets around, but it's the only map that we have uh, because everything has been like the king ever since. Uh, you know, uh, thanks to Stalinism, the Cold War, uh, you know, the 1960s, and the bad leftist politics of that era, uh, and um, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's what I mean by by uh, what I, what I what I mean by many by by taking that into account those 90 years. I don't mean uh, doing like a, you know writing like a, a PhD dissertation on them. I mean uh, you, uh, thinking of those 90 years of defeats uh, when we think of our politics. I'll take some questions then. Um. Yeah, I wanted to direct uh, two questions at Jeremy and Marco, respectively, um, that may appear to some as splitting hairs. I actually think they have a quite good deal of significance to them. Um, so first to Jeremy. Jeremy, you uh, were talking a lot about the way in which Lukács is in an attempt to bring enlightenment to bear uh, in a kind of post, at a moment in which bourgeois enlightenment as it had taken shape in the late uh, 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 1700s no longer really was sufficient to the moment. So it's an attempt to kind of you know, give a, a renewal to enlightenment, you know, that bring to bear self-consciousness, self-transformative action upon the world. And I wanted to, to ask you to articulate that in relationship to another kind of key phrase from the reputation essay, which is that the kind of essence of capital may not even be fully knowable. The totality of capital may not be knowable as such, um, that in a sense, Lukács is articulating a kind of problematic of uh, epistemology related to the object of inquiry that speaks to the question of only actually having access to the object through its kind of uh, appearance, not in its essence, right? That we, we, we experience and know capitalist society, we society in terms of its forms of appearance, not, and this is adopted the Galing language that Lukács would also use, not its essence, right? The, the forms of appearance speak to the essence, but they are not themselves the essence. And the, Lukács is kind of addressing that problem and saying that, in a sense, politics can only really address the level of appearance, but nevertheless, this redounds back upon the essence of capital, that one could change the kind of essence of society through a politics addressing the kind of surface phenomena of that society. So I wanted to ask you to speak to that in relationship to your talk. And then to Marco, I wanted to ask a question about why he's kind of letting Lukács sit comfortably within Lenin's moment, rather than addressing the fact that the register, the theoretical register of the essay is itself an indication of a historical change. That we say that the relation of theory and practice for us is in a sense a kind of calculus for discerning historical transformation and change, 
that in Lenin, theory and practice figured in a particular way that they don't for Lukács. So Lukács, put, like, fundamentally is applying a kind of, as uh, Tim uh, Hall put it, a uh, kind of contemplative uh, moment. He's, he's kind of uh, embodying a contemplative moment vis-a-vis -vis the revolutionary politics of Lenin, obviously very close to it, right? So in a sense, instead of saying maybe 90 years of regression, we want to say like 93. But those three years are very significant, right? Because they mean the defeat of the Russian Revolution, global revolution that it meant to spark, right? And so I wanted you to speak to that. Um, you know, can we actually can we actually bring Lukács into Lenin, or do we actually need to do we actually need to in a sense say that Lukács is fundamentally grappling with the same standpoint, problem standpoint that Franklin School does later? Just seemingly not because he's proxi the proximity to the revolutionary moment is much closer. Yeah. So those two questions. And I'll say everybody, I'd like everybody to respond if they want. Um, well, so two things. I, I don't remember the specific quote. Um, but I think two things are, it, it seems to me, important for talking about sort of appearance, essence, whether the totality of capitalist society is in any way knowable. I mean, in some sense, again, at least, again, not having the quote in front of me, but it would seem to me that in some sense this is part of the issue about like epistemology, because part of Lukács' claim is that capitalist society as a whole is not knowable in some sense, because until capitalist society achieves self-consciousness, it's actually not fully constituted. Like, it's always partial, derivative, you know, all these different formal systems of rationality clashing against one another, jurisprudence says one thing, um, and, uh, and I don't know, cultural studies says another. Um, so on the one hand, there's, I think, an epistemological reason why the totality is always unknowable. And part of that also, second thing, is that's related to what freedom would mean. Because insofar as the, the point of self-consciousness is not to get to the state where you're like, OK, I'm done. Like, so, so like, self -con like I go through my Freudian analysis, and like the moment of my death is the moment where it's done. And that's like perfect, the, the perfect analytic like, coherence. No, the whole point is that the, the moment you actually know it is the, the point when you start setting new tasks for yourself. And then finally, on the appearance essence thing, I think it's funny that this book is known, History and Class Consciousness, is known so much for the reification essay because <laughs> the book is called History and Class Consciousness. Um, and it's remarkable that people who read it um, very rarely actually reflect on, in some ways, what, why did Lukács, why is it not called reification? Like, or, you know, the, the horrors of modernity, or whatever you want to call it. What, what history of <laughs> class consciousness, I think the, the way in which, you know, the, the idea is that the, what is immediate, immediate forms of discontent, immediate forms of proletarians pursuing their interest or whatever become what they could become if they're mediated by their essence, i.e. if they're made historical. And so the, the historical essence of class, the historical meaning of given sort of resistance phenomena of a given factory, you know, where proletariat are, where people are fighting for higher wages or whatever, the historical meaning of that is, I think, for Lukács, what is, is the, the meaningful way to start addressing how you address the fact that the essence is always in the appearance, but the essence is not itself the, a thing you can kind of extract from those appearances and say, aha, like I've got it. It's reification, or whatever. Um, okay, um, okay. Uh, so your question was about um, why I'm placing Lukács so comfortably in the, in the second international radical, in the sort of uh, and, and the Leninist uh, um, era, I'm not. I I I I, I, don't, I, I I'm sorry if I gave that impression. Um, uh, I, I I think he I think he's reflecting on it, uh, and I think he's reflecting on it in a way where um, the, the 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 problems that he was dealing with in soul and form and in uh, in. Uh, History of, the, uh, history of the novel. Theory of the novel, theory of the novel I'm sorry. Theory of the novel uh, uh, and his uh, previous uh, concerns uh, as, uh, who was the one that brought this up? I think it was Jeremy. Um, that uh, uh, he found, uh, that he found uh, the, 
he, he found a solution to, to problems. He found a solution, you know, as a sort of uh, uh, German idealist informed, uh, you know, critic of modernity, non-Marxist, uh, before the, the revolution of 1917. He was already dealing with reification. He was already dealing with those problems. And it was only through uh, uh, joining, uh, you know, becoming a, a, a member and a leader of the Hungarian uh, Communist Party and, uh, you know, through a deep study uh, uh, right after the defeat of the, of the Hungarian uh, of the Hungarian Soviet Republic uh, in 1919, uh, 1920, a deep study of Lenin, that he came to these articles. This, these articles were... Sure, sorry if I interrupt for a second, but I think Tim is on this point. A deep study of Hegel. I mean, like, uh, Lukács before... Um, before the war was very influenced by Kierkegaard's reading of Hegel. So, in fact, <laughs> Lukács went back, went to Marx, and he went to Lenin and whatever, but he also went to Hegel at the same time, which says something about what he thought Marxism was about. So. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so, what, so, basically, what I'm saying is that these, these essays were written in a, in, a, in a period of various years, and then, and then sort of reworked for 1922. What's really interesting, why we should, as you say, talk about 93 years uh, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, political regression, uh, is, is where you can find it is not so much in the essays themselves, but in the reception to them. And, uh, uh, and, and the very negative reception to them and the sort of political environment where they entered where you already had uh, a, a kind of um, a, a kind of a closing of the, of, of the freedom of, 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 uh, of, of debate uh, within the party already the first sort of uh, uh, steerings of, of Stalinism. Brian, did you have a question? I did, yes. Um, so uh, Tim Hughes kind of touched on the scope of uh, Lukash's work and this may be kind of derailing of the whole discussion. But uh, one thing that hasn't come up is Lukash's literary critic. And, you know, but we have talked about his role in the academy and kind of people kind of you know, choosing kind of serve certain kind of analytic you know, purposes. And so I'll just kind of throw the question out there and see what comes back. Like, can we can we recover or can we still use uh, the literary Lukash, the Lukash of the historical novel and realism in the ballads and so forth? Um, and I also recognize that that may not be something you're alive to get Yeah, it's a, it's a really um, it's a really important and a really incredibly difficult uh, question. Um, uh, I find it almost impossible to use. Um, Lukash is writing on literature, and I work on literature. You know. um, I, I, I mean, I so so the realism and the balance. I, I mean, I think my inclination is to say that it is absolutely usable. And in fact, um, Michael Zerdi had recently has a has a has an essay in. Um, I, I, I I hate to sort of um, plug this book that me and Tim have just read, uh, just, oh, no, uh, please uh, please just uh, edited. But uh, we've just edited this book called. Um, Lukács, the fundamental dissonance of existence, and uh, in, in, in that, I mean, so it's largely a book of um, sort of attempts to reread uh, Lukács' work of, in, from different periods, in in a sense in the light of the present concerns, uh, political and philosophical and aesthetic concerns. And um, Lurvie has a has an essay in, there in which he produces a kind of redemptive reading of. Um, of Lukács' essay, essay on Kafka, um, the, uh, and, and it's a kind of um, it's much a, maligned, that's yeah. much maligned essay, and and has yeah, and it has been written. So 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 he does a very good job in that. Um, uh, so um, I think that the work is there. I, I have found it a little difficult myself to to, to try and to actually insert to, to, to make those those daily essays work, but in principle, I think. Can I just say a quick, I mean, Adorno in his biting reconciliation under duress, his essay about uh, the late Lukács, um, in some ways proposes a sort of similar method to what you proposed at the beginning, Tim, which is extorted reconciliation. Different translation. Okay. Um, is, is that he, he argues that, in fact, Lukács's, the critique of Lukács's later works is best staged from the level of the theory of the novel, Lukács's earlier work, and actually what the, the kinds of tasks that Lukács set for himself um, in the theory of the novel 
themselves illuminate the, the you know, I, I won't go into all the details, but illuminate some of the, the weaknesses, but still the, the problems of the later um, literary, criti literary critical work. I'd yeah, like to ask Marco, you, you made a comment that the bad politics politics of the 60s. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? Uh, I meant, I meant uh, uh, that their, their absolute failure to uh, produce something uh, as, with as much potential as the Russian Revolution of 1917 or the Hungarian Soviet Republic or, or any of those things, or, or to leave a, a, a critical uh, advancement or a, a development in Marxism of the kind that Lenin, uh, Luxembourg, or Lukács did. Well, I mean, what are you referring to? referring to France or are you referring to the United States? I'm referring all over the world. That's an extremely uh, abstract question. Well, well I mean, I mean, we, we can start listing failures. <laughs> what interesting thing? What I could stop listing by like the Tet Offensive or something. I could list, <laughs> stop listing the advances that were made in May '68. What happened here in the Civil War? How's France doing? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're getting short. We're getting short. On, how's Russia doing? We're getting short on time. So one last question. Oh, uh, Marco, you raised the question of regression in practice by raising the specter that today capitalism is not in crisis because we don't have a working class movement capable of having the consciousness to overthrow it or the practical ability to overthrow it. I, I, let's play your question of sort of regression in thought in the same sense, and that the notion of subjectivity we have in Lukács that sort of permeates even to, even into critical theory today has become very unrecognizable to the extent that Habermas is occasionally, like people have argued that Habermas's theory of communicative rationality, theory of communicative rationality, theory of communicative rationality, theory of communicative rationality, theory of communicative rationality.